The speaker for the physics portion of the lecture series is Dr. Ronald H. Willens, a research physicist from the Bell Telephone Laboratories. Dr. Willens is very much a product of the California Institute of Technology, for it was there that he obtained his bachelor's degree in physics, his master's degree in engineering, and in 1961, his PhD degree in engineering science and physics. Following a year as a postdoctoral fellow, also at the California Institute of Technology, he became a member of the Caltech faculty. But in 1966, he joined the technical staff of the metal physics group of the Bell Telephone Laboratories. Dr. Willens has received numerous honors and awards, which I shall make no attempt to enumerate here. But as an example, in 1964, he received the Champion H. Mathewson Gold Medal Award of the American Institute of Metallurgical Engineers for the most notable contribution to metallurgical research during the preceding three-year period. Dr. Willens is both a solid-state physicist and a metallurgist. His research interests have included X-ray diffraction, electrical and magnetic transport properties, kinetics of phase transformations, defects in solids, and superconductivity. It is this last phenomenon of superconductivity about which he will speak today. But first, may I call your attention to the discussion session which Dr. Willens will hold on this same topic at 4 p.m. in the Physical Science Mathematics Building, Room 102. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the campus, uh, the Physical Science Mathematics Building is the third building down Riverside from the corner out here. And Room 102 is in one of the large hexagonal pods on the rear of the building. I'm very pleased to present to you Dr. Ronald H. Willens. Dr. Willens. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here today and participate in your annual science series lectures and to talk about a very interesting, mysterious, curious phenomena, the topic we call superconductivity. <clears throat> to get off the ground, maybe I better start and, define, start and define what superconductivity is. All materials, if we put a battery or electrical source across them, will have a small current or a current pass through them. All materials exhibit some resistance to the passage of this electric current. We have insulators, which are very resistant to the passage of electric current. Semiconductors, which allow a little more current to flow. And then our normal metals, which will pass quite a bit of electric current. As the current goes through the material, it dissipates energy. Uh, <clears throat> for a given fixed current, the amount of energy that it's dissipated uh, is proportional to the resistance of the material. We make use of this resistance, and uh, we pass enough current through, we can have enough energy dissipation so that metals can incandense, and you can have such things as lights. Uh, your high resistance materials are insulators. They allow us to handle electricity so we don't get shocked. <coughs> and the mid-range of semiconductors uh, leads to such interesting phenomena as transistors, which have entered our technology uh, to an ever-increasing extent. Now, superconductivity is a phenomena where essentially all measurable resistance of the material disappears. This phenomena was first observed in 1911 uh, by the Dutch physicist Ohms. Uh, actually, it wasn't quite observed by him. Uh, his graduate student was working in the laboratory. And uh, 
he was measuring the electrical resistance of mercury at low temperatures, where it's a solid. And uh, <clears throat> he kept coming into his professor, and he says, you know, I'm measuring the resistance, and all of a sudden, this, this particular temperature, everything disappears. I don't measure resistance anymore. So I'll send him back to the laboratory. He says, get back there, you stupid. Do the experiment right. Well, he kept pestering his professor, and finally said, well, I'll have to go do it myself. So he went to the laboratory, and he discovered the phenomenon of superconductivity. His graduate student didn't do too, do too bad later on. He uh, <coughs> founded the uh, Norelco company, which uh, among one, amongst many of its products are the electric razors of today. But they're one of the biggest European uh, producers of electronic equipment. The uh, first slide shows typically what the uh, resistivity, the phenomena which we're talking about, They're one of the biggest European producers of electronic equipment. The uh, first slide shows typically what the uh, resistivity, the phenomena which we're talking about. First slide. No slide up there yet? Okay, we're taking a second to fire it <laughs> Now, normally a uh, material, a metal, has its resistance vary with temperature, usually the resistance decreasing with decreasing temperature. Now, this is a real metal. Now, what happens to the superconductor, the resistance just decreases, then at a certain temperature, bang, the resistance falls. Uh, and it falls to a a value which is practically immeasurable. It is immeasurable. And the next slide shows typically the kinds of resistances we're talking about. This is uh, the resistivity in uh, essentially a unit we call micro ohm centimeters. Uh, things, this is a log scale, so every mark on the vertical scale is uh, actually a factor of 100. Uh, insulators at the top have resistivities of the order of 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 16th uh, ohm centimeters. Your semiconductors are in this range of resistivity. Here are your metals, your best conductors, the order of 10 to the minus 6. Then way down here, we have superconductors. The change in resistivity at least 100 million billion times less than the best metals we have. Uh, and we have an arrow that's pointing down because we really have, this is the limit uh, where, where the limit is right now. Uh, <coughs> the way we measure this limit is we take a ring and induce an electric current and let the current circulate around the ring. Next slide shows the typical ring with the current circulating around it. Now, normally a good conductor like copper or silver, uh, this current would decay out due to the dissipation, the resistivity of the material. And for copper, it would take a ring about this big and about, a, say, a centimeter cross-section. It'd take the order of a thousandth of a second for the current to decay out, essentially to reduce to zero. Now, a superconductor, they have rings where superconducting currents have been traveling round and round and round for years with no decay. And they measure this current essentially by, <coughs> when you have a circulating current, you have a magnetic field around here. And they go and they sample the magnetic field and see if there's been any decay of it. Well, no perceptible decay occurs over periods of years and years. The current is just completely, dis no dissipation at all of the current. Uh, <coughs> so it's a very intriguing phenomenon. And this phenomenon we really didn't even begin to understand on a microscopic scale until 11 years ago. Uh, in the 45-year preceding period, uh, the whole phenomenon mystified the greatest minds that we could put on this particular problem of superconductivity. Now, this phenomenon <coughs> doesn't occur at room temperature, unfortunately. 
It occurs only at very low temperatures. And when I say low, I mean really low. Uh, you might have thought it was cold this winter or last winter or some other winter previous to this. But the phenomenon of superconductivity only occurs in the temperature range typically between minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 420 degrees Fahrenheit, way down the temperature scale. Uh, it's easier for me to talk not in Fahrenheit, but in degrees Kelvin. Uh, actually, the lowest temperature that we can get to, what we call absolute zero, is uh, estimated to be right now about minus 459.17 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if we start measuring temperature up from absolute zero, and we'll talk about degrees Kelvin, and a degree Kelvin is equivalent, same size as a degree centigrade. In other words, 1.8 times a degree Fahrenheit. So this phenomenon occurs only in the temperature range roughly from zero to 20 degrees Kelvin. Very low temperatures. Well, how do we achieve these temperatures? Uh, they're not too difficult to achieve in the laboratory and even on commercial scales with the use of liquid refrigerants, uh, primarily uh, refrigerants like helium, liquid helium, and liquid hydrogen. Liquid helium boils at 4.2 degrees Kelvin and liquid hydrogen at 20.4 degrees Kelvin. Uh, next slide shows typically a uh, low temperature we call a cryostat. <clears throat> in this region here, we have liquid helium, which we can put in the center. And then to insulate it from the surrounding regions, we first come to a, a vacuum jacket. And then surrounding the liquid helium is a vessel of liquid nitrogen, which is at roughly minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. 77 degrees Kelvin, <clears throat> and then another vacuum jacket, and then finally out into our room temperature environment. Uh, we'll talk later about uh, superconductivity and superconducting solenoids here. We can lower the temperature in the bath uh, simply by pumping on the liquid helium and evaporating it, so it evaporates and cools. And we can, <clears throat> by various tricks and techniques, well, techniques achieve temperatures within uh, 8 milldegrees of absolute zero. Well, let's look at uh, some illustrations of superconductivity, the materials that have possessed superconductivity. The next slide shows a table of the various superconductors. Of the elements, niobium is, has the highest transition temperature. Transition temperature denoted by T sub C. Occurs at 9.3 degree, degrees Kelvin. And these are the various various elements and their transition temperatures for that have various elements that have superconductivity. There are roughly uh, 23 of the elements, 23 of the 92 naturally occurring elements that exhibit uh, superconductivity. But we're limited to temperatures typically about 9.13 degrees Kelvin. In alloys, we can achieve much higher transition temperatures. Uh, this is a recently discovered one several months ago at the Bell Laboratories where we finally achieved, we broke the, what we call the 20 degree barrier. Uh, to us, it was like running the four minute mile since we've been stuck for something like 13 years at 18 degrees Kelvin. Uh, just a small increase in two, two degrees. Uh, consume this amount of time. The number of uh, superconductors versus time is shown on the next slide, uh, typically the discovery of them. It was first discovered in 1911, and this, this is the number of superconductors that were discovered. This slide is a little behind time. Uh, actually, after the phenomena, which I'll discuss, it, <coughs> In a little while, we'll call the high field superconductivity. The research scientists at Bell Labs discovered what we call field of high field, high field superconductivity, Dr. Kunzler. Uh, this thing is taken way up now, and we have at least uh, almost 2,000 known superconductors. Their distribution with temperature is illustrated in the next slide. 
things. Most of them occur at very low temperatures. And very few of them are occurring at high temperatures. Let's say now we've added one out here at 20 degrees Kelvin. And say so this slide is still a little behind times. But the distribution has not really changed that drastically. Now I'd like to, in a very few minutes, try and explain the phenomena of superconductivity to you. It's a very, it's not a simple phenomenon to understand, understand because it took so many years for us to understand it. Uh, I'll just try and give you a very simple picture of what actually is happening microscopically in the material to cause it to be a superconductor. Well, the first thing we have to understand is why does the material possess resistance, electrical resistance? Why is, <coughs> do we have this dissipation in the material? Now, if we take a metal, which is a, some amorphous shaped material, and we look at it microscopically, we find that really the order of the external dimension is not the order of the microscopic scale. In other words, the atoms that compose the metal are arranged in regular, regularly repeating arrays and of given types of structure. Next slide typically shows a structure that you might observe in a metallic material. This is a, see a simple little cube. It's actually an atom in the center. We call it a body-centered cubic structure. The element iron, for instance, has its atoms arranged like this. Uh, we have positive ion cores. Here, in, in the vacant regions here, the outermost electrons, which were associated with the iron atoms, are kind of formed a C and are moving around in the vacant regions. They're actually the things that bind the material together. These are essentially, these are positive charges because they've given up electrons to the C. As you increase the temperature of these materials, of this of material, these atoms vibrate up and down as temperature goes higher, the mean frequencies of vibrations go higher, and the amplitudes of vibrations become larger. Now, <coughs> the next slide shows what's happening to the electrons. Here we see the, the individual atoms. And these are the electrons. They're in well-defined orbits and energy states. <coughs> as you bring these atoms together into the metallic state, the electrons that which are farthest out from the nucleus spend most of their time away from the ion core in uh, higher quantum, what we call the higher quantum number shells. Well, these electrons are somewhat like women. He's got a, a given identifying quantum number on him. And then you start bringing all these atoms together, and he sees that he's got, there's another electron, and he's kind of dressed like him, but he's got the same types of identifying numbers and energies, well, that electron's not going to have any of this business, so what he's going to do is change his energy just a little bit. Actually, he changes his state a little bit. So all the electrons that are in this C all try and look a little bit different to one another. And they're all moving around very fast. The way they change their energy is essentially one goes a little faster than the other one. Gets a little higher kinetic energy. Now, <clears throat> actually, these energy levels are quite discrete. They're discrete. Well, they're, they're what I call quantized. But they're separated by such small values that I'm showing this a continuous spectrum of energy. Now, the electrons that are responsible for all the electrical, optical, uh, all metallic behavior are the electrons just at the top of the band here. And this only would correspond to roughly one electron in 1,000 to one electron in 10,000 of all the electrons in the metal. Now, these electrons at the top here, because they've had to change their velocity from the electrons down at the bottom here, they're moving extremely fast through the metallic lattice. In fact, they're moving at a velocity, velocity roughly uh, three times 10 to the eighth centimeters a second for a material like aluminum. This corresponds to roughly two million miles an hour. He's really streaking through there. But for every electron moving this way, there happens to be one moving just opposite to him. So the net momentum, or the net momentum change of the electrons is zero. Everyone's moving this way, that way. 
And they hit the boundaries of the material and they just bounce back and forth, moving at very high velocities. Now, as these electrons stream through the metallic lattice, they run into these vibrating atoms. And every so often, one of these vibrating atoms gives this electron a kick and changes its momentum. And this is where dissipation occurs, that you put on an electric field onto the metal, you try and change the average velocity of the electrons. As these average velocity of the electrons, the drift velocity changes, <coughs> these positive ions start operating and kicking these electrons and changing the momentum, trying to knock them back or knock them into all directions. This is the phenomena, this is what causes electrical resistivity. Well, how do we go from here from superconductivity? <coughs> You've got to make this electron, make it so that this vibrating atom doesn't kick this electron. And the way it does it is that this electron tries to get bound into a lower energy state with another electron. Well, this is practically impossible. How can two electrons attract one another? They both have the same charge, they repel one another. Well, they can, make, they can be made to look to attract one another. And the way they do this is by using the positive ion that's sitting there that's trying to do the scattering. And the next slide shows simply what's happening. A very simplified picture. This is the equilibrium position of this positive ion. Now, as electron comes streaming through here, and because he's plus and he's minus, he gets pulled in that direction. They attract one another. Now, as that electron goes by, and there's been a small momentum change between the electron and the positive ion, this ion is attached to its equilibrium site essentially by a little spring. Well, he pops back in the other direction. Now, another electron coming this way would have originally saw a region that was more or less negatively charged. But now he sees a region, because this other electron has kicked, kicked him down, which is positively charged. And he gets attracted to that positive, to that positive charge. And the, there's a momentum kick, and this guy, the positive ion, has moved back to its equilibrium position. So <clears throat> this ion looks like it was where it started. This electron's been kicked one way, and this electron's been kicked the other way. The passage of the two electrons have essentially interacted with this positive ions, so they look like they attracted one another. <coughs> they become bound into these pair states, and essentially there's a continual interchange of all the electrons at the top of the span becoming bound up in pairs. Then when one of these positive ions tries to scatter, cause resistivity, well, he just can't scatter that one electron. He's got to break the energy, the binding energy, of the attraction between these two electrons. And if he doesn't have enough energy to do this, then the electrons cannot be scattered. Actually, all the electrons kind of stick together. And it's not just breaking one pair. They all kind of hang together in pa a paired state. Oh, it's like a united we stand, divided we fall case. They just they won't be scattered. So this is why the very simple picture of why electrical resistivity disappears. <coughs> uh, now, I might just make a short digression here. Ever since the conception of superconductivity, it's always been hoped that we could generate magnetic fields by using superconductors. And let me for a moment just take a so short digression here and explain what a magnetic field is. We can generate magnetic fields in numerous ways. Uh, first slide, next slide. If we pass an electric current through a wire, there's a magnetic field associated with this. If we wind this wire into a helix, sometimes what we call a solenoid, you can intensify the magnetic field. And commonly today, this is how you obtain your very high, intense magnetic fields. We measure magnetic fields in a unit called an Orsted, or a Gauss, which gives us a, a measure of the intensity of the magnetic field. Uh, typically, we have solenoids at the uh, Lincoln Laboratories at MIT that 
uh, operate in, with fields of up to a quarter of a million gauss, 250,000 gauss. And there are other solenoids that operate a little lower than that of 100,000 gauss. These solenoids take energy just to keep the current going in the coil because there's dissipation in the copper wire. Uh, for 100,000 gauss, you roughly need 2 million watts of power supplied continually to the, to the copper. Uh, for 250,000 gauss, you have to put in 16 million watts of power. And this, all this energy is, is just taken up in the heating of the copper. And while doing this, you have to use cooling water. Typically, uh, for 100,000 gauss, you have to put in cool with at least 1,000 gallons of water a minute. And uh, for the higher field solenoid, you have to use uh, 2,000 gallons of water per minute to cool it. This uh, amount of power dissipation is enough to heat the St. Charles River which flows next to MIT a half a degree as it passes by the high field magnetic installation. There's other ways to produce uh, magnetic fields. Next slide. We can put a piece of iron into a solenoid and <clears throat> have essentially the magnetization of the iron add to the magnetic field of the solenoid. Or we can wrap it into an electromagnet. Next slide. Typically like this. Now, devices like this, which take lower energy levels, lower power level consumptions, uh, you can generate fields up to about 35,000 gauss with this type of device. Well, now, <coughs> how can we uh, see if we can make a superconductor? We'd could generate these high fields and essentially have resistanceless current continually circulating in these coils to generate superconductivity. But there are three enemies for superconductivity. One is temperature, the other is magnetic field, and the other is current. Now the next slide shows what we call a field temperature plot. This is magnetic field applied magnetic field. This is temperature. As we cool down at zero magnetic field, the material becomes superconducting at T sub C. If we put a magnetic field on, <coughs> and we're at this temperature, when the magnetic field increases to this value, the material becomes normal. This region is normal. This region is superconducting. At absolute zero, this is the highest intensity magnetic field that we can put on the superconductor without destroying its superconductivity. Now, typically for the elements. The next slide shows what these values look like for various things. Here's uh, aluminum, tin, lead, mercury, lead, excuse me. And the highest one is, uh, remember the highest transition temperature material in the elements was niobium. And its uh, critical field at absolute zero is 2,000 gauss. So you can't expect to generate a magnetic field much more than 2,000 gauss with these uh, materials. Now, these materials also possess another strange uh, qual quantity, quality, and that is that if you put a, uh, let me explain it by the series of slides. This next slide shows a ball with uh, immersed in a magnetic field. Actually, this is a ferromag ferromagnetic ball. This is an applied field, and then you see the magnetic lines get concentrated in the ball. If this is a normal material like copper or aluminum, Essentially, there'd be very, the lines would almost just pass directly through the ball with no change or pushing out, not to at least one part in a million uh, of the lines that pass through the ball. This is a superconductor now. And we have these magnetic lines that are passing through the material. If we cool the ball below the transition temperature, a very, very strange phenomenon occurs, which we call the Meissner effect. And that's illustrated on the next slide. All the magnetic flux gets pushed outside of the ball. Just excludes a superconductor does not, we we'll say a superconductor what we call type one, does not like magnetic field within its boundaries, except for a very shallow skin. Essentially excludes it. And we make use of this very interesting phenomenon on the next slide. This shows a little iron 
permanent magnet. And this is immersed in a, uh, a door, low temperature environment. This is a lead dish. And it's in contact with liquid helium. As the magnetic fields come out of this permanent magnet, the magnetic fields it can't penetrate the superconductor, and it suspends the iron bar above the lead dish. Dish. If you start this bar rotating, it just rotates freely without friction, forever. We don't have to use permanent magnets. Next slide shows. Another uh, device, if you have this with, originally, this is, say, material like lead, uh, if you have this above the transition temperature and you have a magnetic field running through it, this ball will be in the bottom here, you cool it down below the transition temperature, the magnetic field gets excluded outside of the superconductor. That means, say, for this region here, there's the magnetic field just gets pushed out in this direction and it gets pushed into the center. Well, all the magnetic field that gets pushed into the center and then out of this ball interact, so essentially this ball stays, stays in suspension there. And if you started it rotating, it would rotate without any friction, completely frictionless behavior, just keep rotating forever, right in the center. <coughs> and this has led to the application for superconductors for gyroscopes. Complete, absent of complete ab absence of friction. Now let me, uh, we have two different types of superconductors as far as our magnetic behavior goes. The next slide shows, illustrates the type of superconductor that I was talking about. Uh, this is the magnetic field that is inside the superconductor B, and essentially as you apply a field H, B is zero until it reaches its critical field, and then bang, all the magnetic field penetrates the superconductor. Uh, this is unimportant. This is a parameter we call the magnetization of the sample. And essentially, all that uh, I want you to note is that essentially the magnetization would increase on a straight line here if this was a phenomena that was occurring, that all flux was being excluded. And then all of a sudden, the flux penetrates, and then the magnetization is zero. Next slide shows a phenomenon which we call type 2 superconductivity. Uh, <coughs> here, B is zero until we reach a field, which we call HC1. All the flux is being excluded now. Then, between HC1 and HC2, flux begins to penetrate. Now, HC, that thermodynamical critical field, lies somewhere between the two. This is the curve showing flux exclusion and also, then all of a sudden, flux penetration. Here's HC. Well, now, if we can push HC2 up to extremely high values, we could have a material that would be superconducting in high fields. And that is essentially what uh, was discovered roughly uh, six years ago at the Bell Telephone Laboratories, how to produce materials that have, have this HC2 at very high values. Actually, the field penetrates the uh, superconductor in a very strange way. The next slide shows how this penetration occurs. These blue lines are external magnetic field, and as the field penetrates, it puts a flux thread through the superconductor, and surrounding this is a superconducting vortex. It's like, uh, if you ever watch the bathtub empty out, and you see a little vortex rotating. Well, this is a vortex of superconducting electrons that are surrounding this magnetic flux thread that's passing through the material. The material in the center, center is roughly normal, is normal, and then it becomes superconducting out here. <coughs> the next slide shows the fields that have been able to be achieved. Now, it's not only necessary to have high magnetic field behavior, you also have to have, be able to pass high currents through the material in order to make a solenoid. Now here's our type 1 superconductors, and you can see that we cannot achieve very much magnetic field. 
way down here in the 2,000 Gauss range, 1,000 Gauss range, and very small current densities. Now these are the materials which have been developed. Actually, this curve goes out here to fields greater than a uh, quarter of a million Gauss. And you can see that we can get current densities the order of a million amps per square centimeter. Well, this is ideal to be wound into a superconducting solenoid. And next slide shows us one of the solenoids that's in operation at the Bell Laboratories. Uh, this particular solenoid is one that goes to 105,000 gauss, 105 kilogauss. Uh, it's wound with superconducting ribbons. You actually use a generator that will only uh, require 30 watts of power while pumping the field up. Imagine what a 30 watt light bulb looks like. That's how much energy we use. We pump this up to 100,000 gauss. We throw a, essentially a switch, which we don't have to put any more electrical energy in, and the current just keeps circulating around here and here indefinitely. So we're completely detached from a power supply or any power source, and we have a, a solenoid sitting there with 100,000 gauss of magnetic field. <clears throat> Ready to do any kind of, we use it primarily for scientific investigations. Uh, actually, there are solenoids that are in, existing or in, planned to be existing to go up into the 150 kilogauss range. Well, what are the foreseeable applications of the phenomenon of superconductivity? Well, we can generate very intense magnetic fields. And this will eventually find, our, find its way into our technology. Uh, one thing which is in the future is generation of electrical power by atomic fusion. That's where we take and fuse atoms together for a nuclear reaction. Now, to get the atoms together, we have to have temperatures the order of millions of, degree, of degrees centigrade. Well, there's no container that'll hold a gas, or what we call a plasma, that is this hot. But we can contain these materials in a magnetic field. And the next slide shows what we call a magnetic bottle that <coughs> we can entirely contain these hot, gaseous atoms inside a solenoid, and then use this essentially hot material to generate electrical power. Uh, it works out that if you use the copper solenoid here rather than a superconducting solenoid, see a superconducting solenoid, solenoid takes no energy to keep the magnetic field up. If you use the copper solenoid here, it would take you as much power, just about as much power to run the solenoid as that you would get out of the generator itself. So it's, it's very infeasible to use copper. Superconductivity is the only real hope for generation of power by this technique. Uh, it also will have use, well, present day use, we're talking about using it for computers, using the phenomena for super, uh, superconductivity for computers. Uh, a computer is a device which is essentially a it's made up of bistable elements. Either a switch is open, or a switch is closed, or a piece of magnetic material is magnetized up, or it's magnetized down. The transistor is conducting, or it's non-conducting. Uh, they're bistable elements. Well, a superconductor also is a bistable element. Either it's in the resistive state, or its resistivity is changed by 23 orders of magnitude, and it's in at least 23 orders of magnitude, and it's in the superconducting state. The next slide shows a, typically how we might make a called bistable latching circuit. Uh, you might imagine that there's current running in branch one. Okay, now current in branch one passes through coil A. This is what we call a cryotron. Now the magnetic field that's generated in coil A is enough to drive the superconductor that's within coil A into the normal state. So no current will pass down this way. It all goes down this branch, passes through here, there's no current in this leg here, so coil B has no current going in. It just continues right down through here. And then through this coil E, and then out. Now, if we wanted a sample to find out which state we were in, 
whether the current was in branch one or branch two, we'd see if this piece of wire had resistance. This current passes through E, it puts this into the resistive state, or this wire had resistance. It's passing through this channel here, so this wire here would have resistance, this wire here would look superconducting. If we put a pulse on this coil here, it drives the resistance, turn, changes this material into the normal state, drives its resistance up, the current ceases to flow in this leg of the branch, and gets transferred over to here, because as the current disappears in this branch, the magnetic field is destroyed in this coil, therefore current can proceed down this leg, go through a beat, this coil B here, cut this whole circuit here off, and we have current flowing in the other leg. So just by putting pulses to here or here, we switch the current from branch one to branch two. It's a bistable circuit. These are called cryotrons. Uh, <clears throat> we'll also find uses in probably power transmission. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of energy which is lost by transporting power from some uh, generating site to some industrial or population center, center. And here we can have lossless transmission. Uh, also, we can have, come, have cheaper generation of power by using DC machines rather than AC machines. Fortunately, we have a technology, though, that is based on high voltage transmission, AC transmission, AC machinery, and this is the major stumbling block or barrier for the use of trans transmission of power by using superconducting lines. Uh, it's no problem building a superconducting cable carry these currents. Uh, <clears throat> there'll be applications, of course, as I mentioned in the next slideshows, bearings. This is a superconductor on a, a shaft. This is a superconducting coil. You have a persistent current going around this coil continuously. It's, nothing, it's hooked up to nothing. It's just going around there continuously. It's not dissipating itself. <clears throat> the magnetic field that it generates pushes the superconductor that's on the rotor here, pushes it away and gets a bearing, a frictionless, completely frictionless bearing. No friction associated with it. Uh, there are superconducting motors. Next slide shows the motor. Next slide. And using, again, the phenomena of flux exclusion. And here we have superconducting wires that are carrying a current as this element of this hexagon comes close to one of these wires, it pushes, actually in this direction, to give us a torque to turn the motor. And motor has been made out of <coughs> superconductors that have gone up to speeds of 20,000 uh, revolutions per minute. So what do we have to look forward to in superconductivity? Uh, next slide shows some of the things that will Space is going to be a large application for superconductivity. We have no problems with reaching cryogenic temperatures in outer space. Uh, you might have astronauts in some space station, and you'll have cosmic showers coming down them, coming down upon them. Uh, <clears throat> well, you have to protect them from these, these high density of charged particles that might bombard them every once in a while. And by the use of superconducting solenoids to generate very high, to generate magnetic fields with essentially no power dissipation, we can deflect the charged particles out of the region of the space station and alleviate the astronauts from the radiation hazards. Uh, the superconducting solenoids we can use for shaping high temperature gases, plasmas, and it can be used for space propulsion. Uh, next slide. Someday we might be generating electrical power by a phenomenon called Magnetohydrodynamic generation, direct conversion of <coughs> very hot gases, which are produced by fusion techniques, uh, to light whole cities. And it will re rely upon high field superconductivity to do this. And this is a essentially the artist's conception of what, what these plasma containers will be. Superconducting magnets will combine sun hot temperatures. The thermonuclear confusion. And then also it might serve as a good source for energy storage. The energy that is in the magnetic field 
shield to carry around with you could eventually be stored there and you could transport it to another locality, <coughs> charge of a coil up on the uh, superconducting coil up on the surface of the Earth, and send the energy source up into outer space, and you had an energy source to tap off. Well, this is a most curious and interesting phenomenon which has intrigued us for years. We fairly well understand the phenomenon now. Eventually, I'm sure that our technology will make use of this phenomenon. And this year, about 10 years from now, maybe 50 years from now, we'll, superconductivity will be as common everyday occurrence around discussion around the home as the television set is today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Willens, for this very interesting discussion of a very intriguing phenomenon. Again, let me remind you of the fact that if uh, Dr. Willen's remarks have generated questions in your mind and you'd like to pursue the subject further, uh, approximately one hour from now you'll have an opportunity to do this in room 102 of the Physical Science Mathematics Building. The uh, Next session will be getting underway with the science lecture and discussion series in about 10 minutes. <laughs>